So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Wednesday afternoon lecture series. My name is uh, Bob Colbert, and uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, who is Jenny Ting. Uh, Dr. Ting is the uh, William Keenan Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of North Carolina uh, at Chapel Hill. Uh, where she directs the Center for uh, Translational Immunology and is co-director of the Immunu uh, or Inflammatory Diseases Institute, um, also at UNC. Um, I first got to know Jenny um, about 20 or almost 25 years ago um, when we co-taught an immunology lab for medical students uh, at the University of North Carolina. You can tell that's a long time ago because um, I said immunology lab and medical students in the same uh, sentence. So we also share a little bit of a common um, academic ancestry uh, because we both did uh, postdoctoral work with uh, Jeff Frelinger, um, although at different times. Uh, but let me just say a few things about uh, Jenny and, and some of the major contributions that she's made to immunology. Uh, she has a very long track record of um, uh, really uh, outstanding work um, contributing to our overall understanding of immune regulation. In the early 90s, um, she discovered how C2TA, which is the uh, uh, MHC class II transactivator um, known to be mutated in, in causative uh, bare lymphocyte syndrome, how this mediates uh, cytokine uh, induction of class II expression, and, uh, which is critically important for adaptive immunity. Um, I think what's really interesting is that it was her interest in, uh, in C2TA which led to, um, and the recognition that mutants in um, proteins that had a similar domain structure uh, actually caused inflammatory disorders uh, that led her to look for genes with a similar domain structure. And um, that resulted uh, in the discovery of a large uh, multi-gene family, I think 22 members to date, at least in humans, uh, that we now know um, as the nod-like receptors or genes that encode the nod-like receptors or NLRs. So um, many NLRs are intracellular uh, pattern recognition receptors uh, involved in initiating or, and or regulating um, the innate immune response uh, to danger signals. Um, created uh, during uh, cellular injury or uh, toxins or invasion by microorganisms. Uh, and of course, we know that mutations in uh, various NLRs, such as NLRP3, uh, cause a variety of systemic inflammatory diseases, such as the cry cryopyrin-associated periodic syndromes, or CAPS. So while many of these diseases are relatively rare, um, unless you work at the NIH, uh, they really are, can be quite devastating diseases, and they really highlight the importance of these genes to uh, fundamental biological and immunological processes. Uh, and this has all become increasingly apparent over the last decade, uh, and it seems to be growing almost on a daily basis. So what we're going to hear about today is how NLRs regulate um, diverse uh, cell death responses such as uh, apoptosis, necrosis, and uh, autophagy, as well as diverse signaling pathways, including uh, pathways involving NF-kappa B and MAP-Ks. So Dr. Ting will present evidence for the broad um, biological and clinical impact of the NLR family of genes. So uh, Jenny, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. And I want to mention that there will be a reception immediately following her talk um, in the library. Okay. Is this on? I just want to thank you so much, Bob, for inviting me and thank all the people for coming despite uh, the weather report. Uh, so what I'd like to tell you today is some of the uh, uh, things that we've been doing recently. And I just want to say that I've known Bob for 25 years, and at that time I was about 10 years old and Bob was about six. So, <laughs> so we're not as old as we look. <laughs> okay. Is this showing up? Okay. So I'd just like to give a big picture because I know this might be a more heterogeneous group and give you some background about this field uh, the NLR field. 
And uh, just to put it, things into perspective, the innate immune sensors or receptor field has really exploded uh, in the last uh, 15 years. The first one, of course, was toll-like receptor, C-type lectins. We now know there are RNA sensors, such as glycolic helicases. There, is, there are a bunch of DNA sensors listed here, and this is where our protein belong, a family of proteins belong. And these have uh, at least two names. One is the name of MBDLR, which stands for nucleotide binding domain, losing rich repeat. And the other is uh, non-like receptors, which stands for nucleotide oligarization uh, and dimerization domain uh, receptors. And uh, to be honest, I actually prefer the MBDLR, which is a name that uh, 22 of us proposed uh, years ago. And the reason is because we really don't know how these function. And this is one of the leading issues that I will discuss in this talk. And so we don't know if these are truly receptors. They might be or might not be. And, but they impact a lot of things, including inflammation, infectious diseases, cancer, et cetera. Uh, the way we came into this, I see Dina in the crowd, and both of us have worked a long time as colleagues in France on this molecule, C2TA. It was discovered by Victor Steinle in Bernard Mock's lab. And um, most of us who are studying MHC jumped on it when this protein was discovered because it is the protein that's mutated in a disease that cannot express class 3 MHC. And this is the class 2 transactivator. And it, uh, we found that it has a, a functional ATP binding domain called nu uh, a nucleotide binding domain. And also it has a leucine rich repeat that's functional as well. So by combining these two, we worked for a long time on C2TA, as has, have others, looking at all its different function. And at the end, I'll come back to this protein. But it's a transcription coactivator. So it recognizes DNA through DNA binding proteins and then activates transcription. But two people in my lab, John Harton and Mike Lindhoff, decided that this is such an important protein because you can pop it on any cell and they will express class 3 MHC, which is pretty remarkable. And they used these two domains and searched the human genome before the human genome was published and came up with 22 genes. And then uh, we named it Caterpillar for a long reason. I won't tell you about it. But uh, now it's renamed either MBDLR or not like receptors. And from that, the 22 genes, that's it. There's no more. If you search and search, you cannot find any more. That's the end of the story. So uh, I always joke with my TLR colleague, unlike TLR, which there's trickles of TLRs that came out, uh, there's only these many NLRs. So one of the reasons we're so interested in this family is because they're linked to human diseases. For example, C2TA, I already told you, is linked to the bare lymphocyte syndrome, which is uh, the lack of class 3 MHC expression, therefore people name this as a bare lymphocyte. Not two, the work of a number of people have shown that this is one of the most important genetic uh, this, uh, uh, link, linkage to Crohn's disease, as well as this rheumatologic uh, disease called Blau syndrome. And NLRP1 is another one that I'll just mention for a little bit. This is linked to a skin disease as well as a variety of autoimmune diseases. And of course, the big one, NLRP3, that I'll tell you a lot more about in just a little bit. So thinking about the NLR family, I just want to summarize. Because most people think about the NLRs, they only think about the inflammasome. And that's actually not the case. And inflammasome, I'll explain it to you in just a little bit. Uh, so. We started because C2TA is a transcription coactivator that leads to class 2 MHC gene regulation, which is the major histocompatibility complex. And more recently, it was found that NLRC5 is a master regulator of class 1 MHC genes and mostly lymphocytes. And so these two are transcription regulators. And this is, again, the reason why I prefer the term MBDLR, because it doesn't look like that these two are uh, RNAs or uh, are uh, uh, typical uh, PAMP receptors. So they're really not considered as PAMP receptor. And I think this point is very important for what we call things, because if we call something a specific term, then we have preconceived notion about what they should do. But in the field of NLR, I think we're still struggling in terms of trying to understand what they all do. The other one, of course, is inflammasome, and I will tell you more about this, but basically this is a complex formation that leads to the processing of IL-1 and IL-18 from their premature form into their mature form due to activation of caspase-1, and I'll explain a lot more about this. But now we have at least 
nine NLRs that have exhibited this function in at least one paper. So there are seven of these. Uh, I'm sorry, nine of these. And then the group that I'll concentrate on the most at the last part of the talk is regulators of NF-kappa B myokinases or interferon. And I will focus my talk really on the interferon signature that's related to these NLR protein. Of course, interferon is really important for a lot of inflammatory diseases and genetic diseases. And today I heard more and more about that. And these are uh, several NLRs are in that pathway. And another one I wish I have time to tell you a lot more about, I know there's a lot of interest here. Many of these NLRs are also uh, causes of cell death, necrosis, and autophagy. And remember uh, that NLR actually are found from plants to humans, and they're preserved all the way in plants, but they also look like apoptotic protease activating factor, APAF1, which makes sense in terms of their role in cell death. So this is an overall picture of this entire family of proteins. Now I just want to go through, uh, all, to kind of check through all of these functions and show you some evidence of what they do so you have, can have a big picture of this entire family of proteins. So the first one is how we came to this. And I should say, by the time we came to the, all of the genes, there were at least five of these proteins that are already found by somebody else. And that includes C2TA. Uh, and of course, we and others have done a lot of work on. But the last protein which uh, function was elucidated is NLRC5. And many of us have done a lot of experiments to try to figure out what does this protein do. And a young faculty who's now at Harvard, Kobayashi, was the first person who had a clue about what it might be doing uh, and maybe doing other things. But the most prominent function is that it regulates class 1 MHC. And it looks like it also binds to, uh, it can be found by chip assays or chromatin IP assay to be located to the class 1 MHC promoter. And this is what we did. So we made a knockout and we look at class 1 genes, class 1 MHC including H2K, beta-2M is an adapter molecule of H2K, TLA is a, a non-classical uh, class 1 molecule. And in every case, if you knock out NLRC5, there's very little class 1 expression on B cells, T cells, or NK cells. And this is true uh, for HL H2K, for beta-2M, as well as TLA. However, it has no function on class 2 MHC gene regulation, as shown here, nor does it have any effect on CD1, which is not encoded by the MHC uh, domain. So uh, this shows that this is maybe a master regulator of these, two, of these three uh, genes. And other people have similar data. And just to show you that we made a knockout of C2TA a long time ago, and NLRC5 right here. And in the NLRC5 knockout mouse, there's reduced class 1. And C2TA, there's no reduction of class 1. And if you look over here, however, there are C2TA knockouts have redu reduced class 2. In fact, class 2 is almost gone. But NLRC5 knockout mice have no reduction of class 2. So it's reciprocal in that these two proteins regulate class 1 and class 2 reciprocally. So when you think about how a protein wants to regulate adaptive immune uh, response, I can't think of a better pathway for them to regulate, which is both class 1 and class 2. So this changes the entire landscape for the adaptive immune response. So I've covered this uh, pretty quickly, and then the inflammasome. And of course, this has received a ton of attention. But I again want to emphasize, inflammasome is just a subgroup of NLRs. There are NLRs that do not have any inflammasome functions. And the reason we came to this is the, the work of uh, several rheumatologists, uh, Dan Kasner and his colleague, Iwona, and Rafael uh, Goldbach, uh, Mansky, of course, are really giants in the field. And Hal Hoffman was the first person who realized the connection of this family of diseases with this gene called NLRP3, initially called cryopyrin, because it, it was found in patients who have an uh, infl inflammatory response to a drop in temperature. So uh, Hal Hoffman called this the cryopyrin protein. In Europe, uh, uh, Michael McDermott was really uh, doing many of the same uh, things in the translational immunology. So it was found that mutations in this protein that initially was called cryopyrin resulted in a lot of skin uh, rashes, uh, arthralgia, stiffness, and there's many, three different diseases that are linked to this with a gradation of severity 
and there's more than 80 mutations now, I think, in this uh, 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 gene that's related to inflammatory response. One of the triumph of the field is that um, they found out that IL-1 is increased in these patients, and you can treat these patients with an IL-1 receptor antagonist called Anacara, and within uh, a day, they all got better. So that's really a remarkable triumph of what the, these groups have done, including, of course, the uh, giants uh, of the field at NIH. So I just want to give you a little bit of background on what the inflammasome activation process is. And uh, we now know that what you really want at the end is processing of pro-IL-1 and pro-IL-18 into their mature form, and that's what the inflammasome concept is. But you have two signals that are required in many cell types, but not all cell types. Some cell types already have signal one that's activated. So these signals can be TLRs or TNF receptor, and Alan Scheer has uh, beautiful work to show that uh, 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 CARD9 is also very important for the first step of inducing pro-IL-1 uh, production. And uh, we showed a long time ago that LPS induces NLRP3 induction and IL-18. So you have to have these to be transcriptionally induced and translationally induced, but this is not enough. You need signal two, and signal two, I always joke with the people in the inflammasome field, basically you look at the cells wrong and they have signal two. So this could be DAMPS, of course that's uh, the work, uh, very early and pre uh, prophetic work of uh, Polly Matzinger at NIH, that there is damage associated or danger associated molecular patterns and PAMPs and many other toxins and dinucleotides, ER stress, um, MAPS protein from the work of Ron Germain, salt, osmolality, et cetera, can induce a number of factors. We don't know how common all of these are. There's debates of how each one is important. And uh, some would argue that potassium efflux is the most important factor. Other, many of us have also seen mitochondrial ROS upstream of inflammasome activation, calcium, mitochondrial DNA release, et cetera. And you have negative uh, regulators as well. And these, really what they're doing is leading to the uh, complex formation of this inflammasome complex, comprising of an NLR protein, indicated here as NLRP3, adapter molecule ASC, and procaspase 1. And what all these things do is cause the assembly of this into a multimeric complex, such as this. And it's predicted to have about six or seven copies of each one of these based on uh, some EM, cryo, uh, cryo EM studies. And this complex then leads to the proteal uh, I'm sorry, proximal activation of procaspase 1 into caspase 1, which then cleaves IL-1 beta and IL-18 to their mature forms. So this whole concept is the inflammasome. And again, for those of you who work with human cells, I just want to say human uh, monocytes actually do not require uh, signal 1, for example. Another concept of the inflammasome is their specificity, although some have very broad specificity, some have very deep refined. For example, NRP3, like I said, many things can activate this. NRP1 is highly specific, especially in, in, uh, in uh, rodents, so anthrax uh, is very important, and that, again, is based on much of the work done here at NIH. And uh, intracellular, more recently, it's found by Vishva Dixik that uh, there's an alternative non-canonical inflammasome that actually activates caspase 11, and that's through intracellular LPS. So LPS can activate this. We don't know all the pathways that leads to this. And uh, there's also uh, DSS colitis can activate NLRP6. Again, it's not entirely clear what activates this, but probably microbiome changes. And finally, in addition to NLR proteins, there are other inflammasomes such as AIM-2 can be activated by DNA, and AIM-2 has been crystallized uh, by the Shell Lab here at NIH. So obviously NIH has done a huge amount of work to really uh, promote this field. So the reason these family, uh, many of these innate immune sensors or receptors were discovered was the thinking that these are related to infectious diseases, and that is indeed the case. I just want to show you some of the work we did, knowing that this is a sea of work that other people have contributed to, 
And uh, so years ago, we wanted to know if this is important for infection, and we put pick influenza. This is 2009, of course, the H1N1 flu was going crazy at that time, and of course, our work was done way before the H1N flu and one flu came, but luckily, we were published in that year. Uh, and what we showed is NRP3 has a dramatic effect uh, in countering uh, the uh, uh, flu infection. So this is NRP3 knockout mice. They don't do very well. They don't survive very well. Wild type, uh, they do okay in this uh, system. And then when we look at viral titers, the NRP3 knockout mice have much, uh, knockouts have much higher viral titer, about a two log difference in viral titer. So we think this is an important protein to combat uh, influenza infection. In the lab of Peter Doherty Conaganti, I published a side-by-side -side paper. And based on that, we propose, and it's really not, we're not the first one to propose this, but many people have noticed that many of these steps leading to IL-1 are uh, targeted by both viruses as well as by bacteria. So it, certainly we've worked a lot of with Francisella and showed many Francisella steps can inhibit this uh, caspase 1 activation. And uh, uh, what we didn't show, however, is that there is maybe a viral protein that can directly influence uh, inflammasome activation. So in collaboration uh, about two or three years ago with the laboratory of Blossom Domania, we looked at this virus, Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus, which can cause uh, cancer. And we were looking through this genome, and we were able to show that uh, the uh, viral genome of this very large herpes virus has a viral NLR encoded by uh, open reading frame 63 that has an MBD and LR domain. And it most looked like uh, a cellular NLRP1, which is an inflammasome NLR. So uh, the fact there's a viral uh, NLR uh, made us wonder if this could inhibit inflammasome activation, and that is what this paper showed, and I just want to show you the seminal two figures out of a large number of experiment, and that if we overexpress this protein, and this is a human disease only, we can show that overexpression of this protein reduced IL-1 production. And if we have overexpression of this protein indicated here, we were able to show that instead of getting pro-IL-1 process into IL-1, we were able to block this with this Kaposi sarcoma viral NLR-like molecule. And uh, the me mechanism turns out that this viral NLR can block the assembly of the inflammasome complex that I indicated to you earlier. So this is what we have done, and many others have looked at many other bacterial diseases, viral diseases, fungal diseases, et cetera, in the role of inflammasome. But what was appreciated that th the role of these proteins are not just uh, limited to infectious diseases, and they have a large role in many other uh, uh, functions. And I'll just list some of the ones that we have contributed to. And the first one is this role in adaptive immunity. The second one is just in general inflammatory disorders. And thirdly, of course, this is a huge uh, group of diseases that we all became much more aware of because of public health hazard, that is metabolic diseases, and finally colitis and colitis associated colon cancer. And I forgot to mention actually the inflammasome, the concept of the inflammasome is really the work of the late York Schaub who did many of the seminal work that lead to this field. And other people have also found roles of these proteins in other diseases such as macular degeneration, other neurological diseases, detox toxicity, ischemic reperfusion, and you name it. So, but when I think about this, infectious diseases, adaptive immunity, inflammation, metabolic diseases, and cancer, that pretty much covers a lot of the problems that we are encountering right now. And just to go through some of these discoveries that we have uh, found is we looked at adaptive immunity, uh, thinking that this should influence uh, adaptive immunity because IL-1 has a profound effect, for example, on TH17. And so this is just one of the uh, typical slides that we have done. We look at NLRP3. This is an innate immune molecule. It's increased during EAE. And if we have a knockout mouse, the knockout have much reduced EAE indicated here. So this has a really strong effect on adaptive immunity. And then we also looked at a inflammatory disease that has nothing to do with the T cells, T cell system, or actually uh, many of the uh, 
things we think about in terms of multiple sclerosis, but it does resolve in microglia activation indicated here. So microglia are all the red, red cells, and in the knockout, there's very little inflammatory response in this model system. The bottom part is just we were looking at the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and this is maybe a uh, reviewer gone wild. They decided that not only should we look at the left hemisphere, because, but we should always also look at the right hemisphere. So we obliged, because it's such an easy experiment, so we did both. And expectedly, there's no difference between the two. So this, uh, of course, shows that it has very important role in many uh, general inflammation, including lung, CNS, skin, and bone. Uh, and then um, several of us also started looking at metabolic diseases, and York Shop was the first one to really look at gout, and Ike Lotz, the first one to look at arthritis, and then many of us looked at uh, diabetes. And this is our contribution, and we're still looking more on this, which is the idea that saturated fatty acid is not good for you, but does it induce the inflammasome? And we know that many of the obesity-related disease are linked to uh, inflammatory, uh, have an inflammatory component. So we use uh, palmitic acid, and because it's insoluble, we have to link this to BSA to get it solubilized. And we can see that if we add signal one, LPS, and signal two, which is palmitic acid, we were able to induce IL-1 production. So saturated fatty acid also goes through this pathway. And we showed that this is through the NLRP3 pathway because if we have a knockout cell, we have very little IL-1 production. And this was published uh, more than two years ago. And to make a very long story short, we were able to show that palmitic acid, which is very nutrient-rich environment, turns off this uh, metabolic master regulator, AMPK, and this in turn turns off autophagy. And many people have linked autophagy as a negative regulator of inflammasome. So these two then, when they're released, this turns on inflammasome, which makes IL-1, which then goes to uh, insulin targeting tissues, such as uh, liver, uh, adipose tissues, and muscle cells to inhibit the, the uh, insulin sensitivity pathway. So this is what we have found. And other people have found many other things, such as cholesterol crystal associated with atherosclerosis, uric acid associated with gout, beta amyloid protein associated with, with Alzheimer's, done mostly by Doug Golenbach and his colleague, ceramide, glucose, et cetera, can activate the inflammasome pathways. And many of us have actually gone in vivo to show that when you don't have the inflammasome pathway, many of the, these diseases are much better, which is why many companies are now targeting this for metabolic diseases. So I've quickly gone through these three, and I'll just go quickly to the cancer field. And uh, this is some studies that we did looking at its relevance in a colitis-associated cancer model. And we have found that actually inflammasome, in contrast to what one can anticipate, when you don't have the inflammasome, you have increased polyp formation in this model system. So actually the inflammasome in the GI is protective, and that's been found in many cases as these uh, TLR molecules, mighty 88 molecules and NLR in the uh, colon uh, pathway are protected because they're to uh, provide a homeostatic pathway. So instead of inflammation being bad, in these cases, the inane immune receptors are protective. And Giorgio Trincari really provided some of the very important mechanism as to why this can be done. And what he showed is downstream of the inflammasome, of course, there's IL-1 and IL-18. And IL-1 doesn't have any effect on polyp formation, but IL-18 has a profound role in that if you take away IL-18, polyps actually go up in the colon. And this is due because IL-18 can reduce IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. IL-18 can also downregulate STAT-3, which is very important for colon cancer. And IL-18 can repair the epithelium in the, in the experimental colitis. And other, and other, other groups have also found this. So uh, this is uh, uh, just showing you inflammasome have at least two targets, IL-1 and I, beta and IL-18, and they may have divergent roles in different tissues. So I've quickly gone through this very huge field of inflammasome, and now I just want to touch on this and show you some unpublished work that we have been working on in terms of the NLR proteins and another very important pathway, interferon. And uh, so 
again, uh, in the first discovery of NOT1 and NOT2, uh, several of the early work of NOT1 and NOT2 have shown that they're related to NF-kappa B. Both the work of John Burton as well as the work of Gabriel Nunes have pointed to this. And so we were interested to see if there are other NLRs that can regulate NF-kappa B, for example, MAP kinases. But additionally, we have found a link to interferon. And I'll just tell you some of the work that we have done in this. What was surprising is we found most of these cases, these proteins are negative inhibitors, are inhibitors of the interferon pathway. So, uh, or of NF-kappa B pathways. So the first one that we found is uh, one that we isolated in two, early uh, 2000s. And this one was named different things, including Monarch, and now it's named NLRP12. And we have a paper uh, that came out about a year or two ago showing NRP12 can regulate uh, the NF-kappa B pathway. And there are now at least four papers indicating this is the case, and these are shown here. In our model system, we looked at, at a colon cancer colitis model, and we found that the NRP12 negatively regulates NIC, which is the NF-kappa B inducing kinase, which causes non-canonical NF-kappa B to be induced. And NLRP12, just to show you, in overexpression systems, if you have NLRP12, this is a very old paper, reduces the amount of NIC. And uh, I won't get into all of the mechanisms, but because of this, it downregulates non-canonical pathway and influences non-canonical pathway uh, chemokines, such as CXCL12 and 13, which are now all found to be really important for solid tumors. A second NLR that we found to be negatively regulating cytokines is NLRX1. I won't have too much time to talk to about this, except to say this is a very interesting mitochondrial NLR, and we found it to be a negative regulator of cytokines such as TNF, IL-6, and uh, interferon. And in our hands, we found this interferes with this protein called mitochondria antiviral signaling protein, MAPS, and therefore reducing both uh, interferon as well as these inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the laboratory of uh, Rongfu Wang and our lab also showed that this is a negative regulator of the TRAP6 pathway. Therefore, in macrophages, it reduces LPS signaling. In macrophages, it actually doesn't reduce interferon. Um, other people have shown uh, it's a net positive regulator of ROS. We have shown it's a positive regulator of autophagy. Just to summarize what I've told you, NLRX1 binds to this MAFS protein, which is really important for TNF IL-6 and interferon, and this is all occurring in the mitochondrial. Now, more recently, the laboratory uh, uh, of, uh, wait, I, have, I don't have that yet. Uh, another lab have shown, has shown that uh, NOT2 can also interact with MAFS, so this may be a pretty uh, common association of NLRs with MAFS. More recently, the laboratory of John Ron Germain has shown that MAPS interacts with NLRP3 to increase inflammasome. So we have found several of these NLRs interacting with MAPS. In our case, we use endogenous NLRX1 and endogenous MAPS to show this interaction. So these cells show that these are NLRs. The NLRX1 is an inhibitor, NLRP12 is an inhibitor of these pathways. And so we were looking at another molecule called NLRC3, and this is the one I'll spend most of the time on. Uh, this is a protein with a CAR domain MBDLR. It's encoded on human on chromosome 16, and we showed in a Nature Immunology paper published over a year ago that if we overexpress NLRC3, we have a reduction of TNF as well as IL-6 response uh, in response to LPS. So we think there's a link between the TLR pathway and NLR pathway. If we do a shRNA knocking down NLRC3, we see increased transcription of these genes, suggesting that it is an inhibitor of transcription of these genes. So then uh, the mechanism, we tried to look at its mechanism and we narrowed it down to a trap and we found NRC3 can enter with aqua trap during LPS treatment. And this is shown here, which we showed that NLRC3 interacts with TRAP. If we mutate a TRAP binding site, uh, we uh, knock down this interaction. And through many different studies, we were able to show that in NLRC3 knockout mice uh, cells, there's a reduction in the activating ubiquination of TRAP6. 
and TRAF6 is act activated by the K63 ubiquitination of uh, TRAF6. And in NLR knockout mice, there's increased activation of this K63 ubiquitination. So this would lead to TRAF6 uh, activation. So to summarize, we think what happens is NRC3 interacts with TRAF6 uh, to prevent it normally from being uh, activated by ubiquitination. If we remove NRC3, we now have enhanced K63 ubiquitination. So this is do anything in vivo in, in response to LPS, and we showed that NRC3 knockamides do have increased TNF, increased IL-6 in response to LPS treatment. So this just indicates that this molecule has an inhibitory role in inflammatory response. So I'll lead you now to a second function that we have recently found. And I just want to preface this by saying that many NLRs actually have multiple functions. For example, NLRP1 is known to be really important in apoptosis, also important in inflammasome, and also important in uh, uh, lim uh, hemopoietic um, myogenesis, uh, I'm sorry, hemopoiesis. So it's known to be important for all these functions, and we really don't know how we can tie all these three together. So it's not surprising that NRs may have different functions depending on what you're looking at. And so this is uh, one of the students in my lab really wanted to see if she can find interferon changes in NR. So she screened a number of NR knockouts that we have made, and what she found was this, and uh, showing NLRC3 is, reduces DNA-induced type 1 interferon response. And this is shown here. She used poly-DADT, which is an analog of double-stranded DNA, and used it extracellularly, which would be activating through extracellular membrane-bound receptors, or put it intracellularly into cells, so that would be uh, in intracellular sensors or receptors, and I should point out that all NLRs are considered intracellular sensors or receptors, okay? while TLRs are considered as membrane-bound uh, innate immune receptors. So she found that if she put double-stranded DNA analogs into cells, that the wild type has a pretty good response in terms of interferon, but the knockouts have an even more profound response when it comes to interferon. And the uh, NLRC3 knockouts have a very small effect when it comes to poly-IC or LPS. And this is just showing with IL-6, and we see the same pattern, that it's intracellular double-stranded DNA, suggesting it's DNA involved in DNA sensing, but as a negative molecule regulator of DNA sensing. So the knockouts have a higher response uh, to intracellular DNA. So since intracellular DNA is a, a mimetic, uh, essentially, of uh, DNA viruses, we wanted to see if this has any function when we infect cells with HSV, uh, herpes simplex virus 1. And we were able to induce interferon induction, and the knockouts have higher in, uh, levels of interferon again. And we were able to show this. Now, in my, our previous paper with LPS, we showed that it involved TRAP6. So we wanted to see if this is all because that there's a difference in TRAP6. And we did a knockout study uh, provided by uh, TACMAC, and we were able to show that TRAP6 knockout cells do not show any difference in terms of interferon induction by HSV. So we think with HSV response, this is separate from the TRAP6 pathway. So we think this is a different pathway than the TRAP6 that I was telling you about. So we looked at more clues in terms of what the pathway might be. And uh, uh, mostly the laboratory of Dan Portnoy and his colleagues, as well as others, have found that cyclic GMP can induce type 1 interferon when it's produced by bacteria. And the bacteria that produces this include listeria. So we wanted to see if NRC3 can regulate cyclic nucleotide induced type 1 interferon, and this is shown here. So the, again, wild type maps, NLRC3 knockout maps, and this is what the cyclic nucleotide. In every case, the NLRC3 knockouts produce more interferon. So again, suggesting it's a negative inhibitor, it's an inhibitor of these pathways. And it also did this with the uh, whole, vi uh, whole bacteria, listeria. So at this point, these two clues were enough to make us think about a specific pathway, 
that uh, has gained a lot of attention, uh, especially last year, and that's the STING pathway. The STING pathway, uh, many, there's many studies trying to figure out what are the pathways that are important for DNA sensing by intracellular molecules. And the STING has become the major central adapter of many different pathways. So DNA can feed in, for example, into IFI-16 or P200. This feeds into the STING pathway. Uh, DNA can be converted by poly polymerase 3, go through Brigai and MAPS, activate the STING pathway. DAI goes through the STING pathway. But one of the things about STING is it activates TBK1, activates in IRF3 uh, and NF-kappa-B to induce interferon. So this is the central molecule that's a central dicyclic nucleotide sensing molecule because it's been crystallized and found to bind to cyclic dinucleotide. But also the laboratory of Sting, uh, Glenn Barber has found that this can bind directly to DNA. So this can either uh, sense DNA or cyclic dinucleotide activating TBK. So we wanted to see if NLRC3 can be placed in this pathway. So again, we have Sting here, TBK here. So we wanted to see if overexpressed NLRC3 can reduce interferon promoter activation by Sting, and it did, and by TBK, and it did. And because the scale is so low, this is probably about uh, 20 fold, and IRF3 and NRC3 has no effect on IRC, uh, IRF, uh, IRF3. That's because it acts over here, and so if you have IRF3 activation, it's too high, it cannot affect uh, downstream IRF3. So this is where we're placing NRC3 right upstream in the sting <coughs> and uh, TBK pathway in these two. So then we wanted to know, can NRC3, how does NRC3 inhibit sting and TBK? Does it directly bind to these two? And so we started with overexpression system by overexpressing NRC3 and looking at its interaction with sting, and we were able to see pretty strong interaction with sting, as well as some interaction with TBK right over here. And then we wanted to know if this could happen in a hemidogenous pathway, because this is all overexpressed. So we wanted to see if this can happen with endogenous sting that's not overexpressed. And we were able to show that overexpressed uh, NLRC3 can interact with sting right over here. They, so they co-precipitated with each other. But NLRC3 can also co-precipitate with endogenous TBK1. And we did a lot of mapping, and like I said, this paper is not published, but soon to be published in Immunity. And we were able to show that the uh, fragment that NRC3 interacts with in Sting and TBK are exactly the same domain that these two molecules use to interact with one another. So the proposal is NRC3 can interfere with the interaction of Sting and TBK. So then the reviewers asked us, can we show this with purified protein? And as all of you know, purified NRs are a nightmare, but we were very happy that we have a colleague who can produce these proteins, and we were able to get purified NRC3, and we used two different stings, and these stings were used for crystallization by the Ouyang lab, and we were able to show that sting and NLRP3 purified can interact with each other right over here. And the reverse direction, we were able to show that if we precipitate NRC3, it also co-precipitated sting. So I think this pretty clearly shows that sting can interact with NRC3. Then the question is, what is the functional consequence of this? We know one of the functional consequences of sting activation is TBK. Remember I showed you TBK is downstream of sting, and TBK is the TAC kinase, which is an NF-kept-B activating kinase. And uh, if you activate sting, you can see TBK phosphorylation indicated here. So this is wild-type cells uh, activated with double-stranded DNA, and TBK is not that much phosphorylated until six hours after treatment. If we look at NRC3 knockout cells, we see increased TBK phosphorylation very early on, so there's a kinetic switch uh, to a very early time point. Uh, of TBK phosphorylation. Then we know, want to know, look at a second function of sting, that is when sting, uh, is, uh, sting containing cells are treated with double-stranded RNA, two things happen. First of all, sting assume a very unique localization, uh, as shown by Glenn Barber and Akira, and that is it becomes perinuclear, 
or has a punctated appearance. And we showed if we overexpress NRC3, however, the perinuclear experience, uh, appearance dis almost disappeared from 10% about to 1%. And we cannot find any cells with this punctated appearance. So it changed the localization of sting. So it changed uh, TBK, which is downstream of the sting, and it also changed the localization of sting from where it should be associated with activation to a non-activation form. And the third way we looked at this is can we change the co-localization of uh, TBK indicated here? This is TBK, and the second two uh, roles are sting, they're co-localization. So we are looking at different fractions on an FPLC column from wild type cells and NLRC3 knockout cells, and working, looking at co-fractionation uh, of TPK indicated here, which is not different between wild type and NLRC3 knockout cells, versus sting, and you can see that wild type, we can see it up to here, but there's more sting that's co-localized with the TPK column in non-treated cells in NLRC3 knockouts. But if we treat these cells with, infect these cells with HSV, there's a more dramatic co-localization of sting in the knockout cells, and this is TBK and this is sting, so there's more co-localization of these bands in the knockout cells than in the wild-type cells. To quantitate this, we quantitated it based on the first fraction and did it as a ratio of the first fraction. And it's probably clear as here, which is the HSV-treated cells, and these are looking at uh, fractions that contain both TBK and sting. And so you can see in the knockouts, we have a lot more fractions that contains fractions with both TPK and sting. So this is using a biochemical approach, kind of confirming that when you don't have NRC3, sting and TPK became more co-localized to the same biochemical fraction. Then we wanted to biologically ask if NRC3 is a uh, negative, in, is an inhibitor of sting, we would expect that in NRC3 knockouts, we would have more sting activation and therefore more antiviral responses, and we should see less viruses. And that is indeed what we saw in vitro in cell culture. That is, if you infect NRC3 knockouts with HSV, we saw less HSV genomic copy as indicated here. We don't see an effect of NRC3 in poly-IC or in Senda virus, but we actually later now, we do see an effect on some viral uh, uh, RNA viruses. We still don't understand how that is achieved, but it's much more preferential for DNA viruses. So then in vivo, is there a difference? So we went all the way from overexpression to endogenous NR3 not C3 knockout to biochemistry to function of sting, and now we want to see an overall mouse what happens when in, we, we infect these mice with HSV1. And so what we expect again is NRC3 is an inhibitor of the sting pathway. We would expect if we knock out NRC3, we will have more of a sting function and therefore more of an antiviral effect. And so we would expect these mice, NRC3 mice, to do better when they're infected with HSV1. And indeed, they did. They all did better. And the wild-type mice did very poorly in that uh, in an infection that's IV. We saw much uh, less survival because these mice have a dramatic drop in weight uh, of over 20 percent. And in these knockout mice, we do see enhanced uh, interferon, we see enhanced IL-6, enhanced TNF, and lower genomic copies. So uh, in our proposal then, we would say that NRC3 is there to naturally prevent sting from activating when there's no virus. But the question is, how does uh, this break becomes, uh, is released during viral infection? And we haven't done a whole lot, and this is in a supplemental figure in the paper to address some of the reviewers' comments. What we saw is that if you have DNA or DNA infection uh, with DNA viruses, there's a drop of NRC3 expression. And I couldn't make my student come in between after six hours to 16, because that's, I think, after 12 hours of working in the lab. But we don't know what happens in between, uh, but there's a significant drop of this expression. 
So in our model system, we would propose as follows, that is in a steady state, NRC3 can interact with sting because we saw this interaction without doing anything. And so this prevents sting from activating TBK1, from associating with TBK1, and uh, activating the entire interferon pathway. However, when you have a uh, viral infection, NRC3 is removed, and we would suggest one of the way it is removed in expression. Its expression went down, and this allows then uh, the sting molecule to interact with TBK. We don't think this is the only way that does this, but this is a possible way it does this. And then sting interacts with TBK and activates the entire pathway. So we then come to the uh, uh, overall picture, that is we have NR proteins that can regulate transcription activation of class one and class two. We have NR proteins that act as inflammasome. We have NR proteins that change interferon in my talk, and also there are some that in, uh, changes NF kappa B and so forth. So how do we have an overall picture of this? I'm not sure I can introduce an overall picture, but I can think of some uh, consensus in terms of what these might be doing. So I come to NLRs and nucleic acids. And going from here, we know C2TA, based on the work of many, that the C2TA promoter is, of course, a DNA. It binds to DNA binding proteins, and C2TA is found at the promoter by chromatin IP. So C2TA is very good at recognizing DNA. Whether it's DNA protein complex or DNA, it's not entirely clear, but it certainly can recognize DNA. Our previous work with NLRX1 suggests that this molecule can interfere can interfere with this pathway, which is uh, RNA sensing by Rig I, which binds to uh, uh, RNA molecule. And so this molecule can also be part of the RNA sensing pathway. We now have evidence that NRC3 uh, can uh, regulate this DNA sensing pathway of sting and TBK. So in many of these cases, we're suggesting NLR may be connected to DNA and RNA in innate immun immunity, we call this DNA and RNA sensing. In transcription, we call this transcriptional activation. And I should just point out there, there are papers showing that NRP3 can recognize mitochondrial DNA. So coming to a full picture, whether that's something we should all be thinking about, that is maybe there is an underlying rule and it's connecting NRs with nucleic acids. So I just wanna then come back and thank all the people who are involved in the NLR field in my lab. Greg Robbins and Aga Truex worked on NLR, uh, the NRC5 molecule. Sushmita and Dennis worked on the neuroinflammatory component. Hightal and Dennis worked on the uh, metabolic diseases. Khoi and Mo worked on uh, the viral recognition. Monica and Lou, two amazing graduate students, and uh, Karen Swanson worked on the NLRC3 proteins and did all the work on that protein. And these are our collaborators, some uh, in-house, Blossom, Sean Gregory, uh, Josh, uh, Hans, uh, Chris John, and Arlen all helped us with the uh, viral models and colitis models, and Beth Kohler and Jin Yao helped us a lot with making knockouts in the very early days, and Alex and his postdoc did a lot of work on purifying these proteins, and Ooyoung and uh, Hong Bing Su provided many of the reagents that I mentioned. I just wanna thank you very much for your attention. Hey, Jenny. Yes. That's great. Um, I, I wasn't reviewer number three who, who commented on the expression, but I did have a question oh. about uh, expression. Are you reviewer number two? <laughs> yeah, I was the good reviewer. No. Um, Regarding tissue-specific expression of NLRC3, I looked in my handy-dandy, my immunogen app, yes, yes. and I noticed that NLRC3 is very high in CD8 cells and NKT yes. cells, for yes. example. and so B cells. Oh, okay. And, and B so cells. do you imagine that's specifically there to limit production of type 1 interferons in those cells? And I don't know if it's type 1 interferons, so we're obviously working on those. Mm -hmm. And that's been the bane of our existence, is trying to find a function for those. It's not very simple. If you just take NLR C3 knockout mouse and just treat them with whatever T cell activators or B cell activators, you see nothing. There's no difference. You have to really, really dig. And we've dug, and hopefully this year we'll have some answers 
about their function. They all, seems to be, they all seem to be negatively regulating T cell functions or B cell functions. So that we're pretty clear about. But uh, do you see, a, I guess, a aberrant interferon production? Uh, in we have yeah. in one of the systems, okay. yes. So if, um, going back to the NLRC5 work, which is maybe yes. less interesting than what, what you're talking about, but um, there, it seems to me from the literature there was some evidence that it might be a pattern recognition yes. receptor, but it's clearly important for class one. Yes. What, what's the yes. consensus So it's on a that? very confusing field, NLRC5. So we looked uh, in, in, our, in human cells, and recently there's a paper that looks almost like our paper. So I'm pretty sure that if you do the same experiment in human cells, it looks like an inflammasome protein. And it almost mimicked in our uh, P3. So we thought, and we could see that it forms a complex. And so when the paper came out, when we made the knockout and we couldn't see that, we thought, oh, we're really wrong. And recently there's a paper last year, I think late last year on rhinovirus, they have Panel by panel, it's almost the same finding. So I think in human cells, it may have a, and we all use knockout, we use primary cells, did everything you can possibly think of. Looks like an inflammasome molecule. There are three groups that says it's also inhibitor of, actually either inhibitor or activator, that's where the confusion is, of whether cytokines or interferon, and I don't really know. I think there may be complexity of this, Remember, NLRs have a lot of isoforms, and we don't even want to talk about this because who can answer that? NLRP3 has 30 isoforms. So we don't know what they do, and there may be isoforms that are inhibiting, there are isoforms that work on other things. Uh, all of these have multiple, multiple isoforms. So I think the field will be very complex since there are so many genes, so many isoforms, potentially lots of functions. And so one of the reviewers did say that regarding, and if it's a reviewer here, I think it's what you said is lots of wisdom, but the reviewer said that you already found one function for this, how could this have a different function? And I'm like, I don't know what to say because most NLRs have multiple functions, you know. So, but if you're here, you're great. <laughs> I'm not den denigrating you, <laughs> but it's just the NLRs just have multiple functions because they're so complex. And, and was it more important for, in terms of class one, for? for basal expression or inducible or? Yes, both. so for both, and I didn't show you. But what I showed you is C2TA is amazing because you take a C2TA away, away there's no class two. But this one, you take it away, there's 30% you know, residual class one. So one of the things we've been wondering is what is the other molecule? Or what are the other molecules? And there may be other NLRs in that pathway. We also fun, found other things, unlike C2TA, which works in every tissue, and RC5 doesn't work in all tissues. So there's more complexities about this. Can I ask you, it was very nice. Can I ask you a question about the NLRC3 knockout? Certainly. Mice again, did you actually see any um, metabolic phenotype, any fat problem, uh, issues with fat distribution, lipodystrophies, yes. or do you actually, did you see any vascular? We're looking a lot at those issues. I think I told you that we made some double knockouts and they look horrible, you know. I think you have metabolic. Yeah, they look horrible. We have some mice that look really fat, so certainly metabolism, um, and we have some pathways of where the fat might be. Yeah. So I think like I say, the NR field is just, to me, it's really amazing because of all the things it impacts. So definitely in metabolism. Sorry. Uh, do you know if um, NRC3 uh, binding with uh, sting influences, uh, sting binding with ligand, like sector? I'm sorry? NRC3 binding with sting, um, does it influence sting binding with its ligand? like cyclic dinucleotide. Yeah, we haven't, you know, uh, we haven't really looked at cyclic nucleotide. We just look at TBK, uh, but we're, because one of our collaborators is the person who discovered Sting Ouyang. He's the guy who discovered the crystal, you know, made this crystal structure and showed it can also bind to 
cyclic dinucleotides. So we're working with, working on that aspect. Um, so we have his protein, and we showed interaction. So we're kind of going down that pathway. So um, I just wanted to say again, thank you for coming and thank you for giving a, a great talk. And there is a reception now. Um, Jenny has to leave promptly at 4.30. So if you want to talk to her, please try to grab her. <laughs>